Hi, Nancy. Hi, Shane. Hi, Lauren. Hi, Shane. All right. So we're going back to question time today. Yes. All right. What is the most valuable thing you own? I would probably have to say jewelry, you know, like family heirloom stuff that has been passed down. Got, a, you know, a few pieces from my grandmother's. Although I have to say one time my grandmother gave my sister a pearl necklace of hers that she swore was incredibly valuable. And it turns out the pearls were fake. <laughs> I guess that happens a lot. <laughs> my mom's friend is a jeweler and like people think they have really valuable stuff. And then she brings it to like the like jewelers, you know, to be appraised. Yeah. And uh-huh. they're like, this is like costume jewelry. Yeah. Yeah. Painted that's... with gold. <laughs> Welcome to the American Geophysical Union's podcast about the scientists and the methods behind the science. These are the stories you won't read in the manuscript or hear in a lecture. I'm Shane Hanlon. And I'm Nancy Bompy. And I'm Lauren LaPuma. Oh, hi, Lauren. And this is Third Pod from the Sun. I asked about valuable things because our episode today is about one of the, uh, I guess, arguably most valuable objects in the world, the Hope Diamond. Is the Hope Diamond like that one in Titanic? Like the movie? Yeah, the movie Titanic. No, it's not. That's not a real... Oh, Nancy. Titanic was fiction, Nancy. (laughs) I know, but isn't that like... uh, I know. But what was that like the diamond necklace she has with the blue? No. Oh. No. Well, well, that necklace (laughs) might have actually been based on the Hope Diamond because the Hope Diamond... Yeah, the Hope Diamond is a rare blue diamond. (laughs) I'll never let go, Jack. (laughs) I'll never let go. (laughs) Anyway, back on track. So a few months ago, I interviewed Jeff Post, who is the curator of the National Gem and Mineral Collection at the Smithsonian Institution. And this is a collection of about 375,000 mineral and rock specimens collected from all over the world, including about 10,000 gemstones. And this collection lives at the National Museum of Natural History here in D.C. And it's everything from basic minerals and rocks you'd probably find in your backyard to giant crystals and really valuable precious metals like gold and silver and then gemstones, um, a lot of which were gifted to the collection as pieces of jewelry. I was actually just there a few weeks ago at night. It was kind of neat. That's kind of cool. Um, Well, no, I wonder, like, I've been there a few times, but I've always wondered, it's cool to look at, but like... Is it just for show? Is there research? Like, I, is there some deeper thing than just what we see? Yeah, well, it's actually kind of for both. One of it is to showcase the beauty of these specimens, but there is a lot of research that goes on as well. Um, scientists from all over the world use the specimens for research, but the Hope Diamond is kind of like the jewel, no pun intended, um, <laughs> of this collection. <laughs> the Hope Diamond. So it's actually a 45.5 carat heart-shaped blue diamond. See, not that far from Titanic necklace. Actually, pretty close, yes. Mm. Um, and it's... Insured for approximately two hundred and fifty million dollars. Two hundred and fifty million dollars. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's wild. So Jeff, as the curator, he's responsible for this priceless diamond and all the other things in there, right? Yeah. Oh well, that reminds me, like, of the guy who was in charge of the Apollo moon rocks um, oh. that we interviewed a couple months ago, Ryan Ziegler. You know, I mean, he's like being in charge of this really. Oh, almost priceless. priceless. I mean, I things. guess they say like, wow. I would never want that responsibility. No. <laughs> yeah. No, me neither. I mean, the Hope Diamond is amazing and it's on display. Like Shane, you just went to see it. I've seen it. Anyone can walk right up to it and look at it. But the collection has so many other really valuable, rare, beautiful minerals and rocks that a lot of people don't get to see. A lot of them are, so some of them are on display in the museum, but the vast majority of the specimens are actually housed a couple levels up above the main floor at the museum in boxes and drawers. And Jeff was actually kind enough to give me and a few of our colleagues a tour of the collection. He even brought us into the vault where they keep the very valuable things. Um, And so that is what we will get into in part two of this episode. But right now in part one, Jeff is going to tell us about the Hope Diamond, about its history, and about what his job is like being responsible for this item. So my name is Jeffrey Post, and I am the curator of the National Gem Mineral Collection at the Smithsonian Institution. I am also a research mineralogist here and currently chairman of the Department of Mineral Sciences. So what do you, what does that mean exactly? Uh, what does your job as curator job? do? Being the Smithsonian, part of the job here is helping to take care of and build that collection. Mm-hmm. And so for the last oh, 25 years or so, I've been curator of the collection, which means sort of providing the leadership to hopefully you know, take the collection to the future and uh, make sure the collection is getting used by people who need to use it. And so a typical day is spending time 
helping people use the collection, sending out samples, uh, acquiring new materials for the collection, working on whatever arrangements you have to make to have things come and go out of the collection, uh, supervising the collection managers that work with the collection, also trying to spend a little time doing my research. And so what is some of the individual research that you're doing? There's a couple areas of research that, that I've that sort of defined my research career, and they're about as opposite end of the mineral spectrum as you can get. One is, and in, in sort of a major part of my research has been sort of environmental mineralogy. So looking at minerals that are found in soils and sediments that occur as coatings on surfaces of rocks uh, are associated with uh, streams and rivers and, and oceans. And these are the minerals that occur at this interface between the solid earth and the living you know, ecosystem that we all are part of. So working on some of the ugliest and sort of grungiest minerals in the world is part of my interest. And then the other side of the spectrum is working on diamonds. Turns out, you know, diamonds are fascinating materials, not only because of where they come from, they come from a part of the world that we can't directly access. You know, they form more than 100 miles below the surface of the earth. And so diamonds coming to the surface are a little bit like meteorites coming from another planet. I mean, they're telling us about a, a world, a place that we can't directly go to. Frankly, what kind of got me into that was the Hope Diamond. I mean, the Hope Diamond is this large blue diamond. In the untold centuries since it was formed in the heart of the earth, this gem of gems has captivated kings and queens, showgirls and socialites. So tell us a little bit about the story of the, of the Hope Diamond for someone who doesn't know anything about it. Well, the Hope Diamond, yeah. You know, people come here and they have all heard of the Hope Diamond and you walk into the gallery and you look in the, you know, look in the case and you probably do this, right? You go, okay, there's this little diamond in there. Well, kind of, you know, most people are thinking it's got to be something about the size of a softball, right? Because we've all heard about the Hope Diamond. The most common misconception is it's the largest diamond in the world. It's not. By, it's 45 and a half carats. You know, it's bigger than most people's engagement rings, but it's by a long shot, not the largest diamond in the world, you know, a tenth of the size of the largest diamond in the world. So what makes it so interesting? Why is it so valuable? Why is it so, you know, famous? Okay, it's a blue diamond. It's the largest natural blue diamond that we know of, this faceted blue diamond. The fact that it's blue means it has a whole interesting geology story, but it also means that it's always been a very unusual diamond throughout its history. And because it's this unusual blue color and size, it's a diamond that we can trace back its history. You know, it's hard to lose a large blue diamond in history. You know, if it's a colorless diamond, if somebody recuts it, if it gets stolen, it gets sold, it's hard to trace it because there are a lot of colorless diamonds out there and they all kind of look alike, right? Mm -hmm. But large blue diamonds have always been very rare. And so throughout history, when somebody sees a large blue diamond, that's a big deal. And they write about it, they notice it, they talk about it. And so we can follow the history, therefore, of this diamond back better than we could most diamonds. And so we know from that now, this blue diamond originally was found in India, probably in the middle, late 1600s. It was sold in 1668 to King Louis XIV of France. He bought it, it was 113 carats, so about two and a half times as big as it is now. He had it recut into a heart-shaped stone that was about 69 carats. It became part of the French crown jewels. In 1792, during the French Revolution, that diamond was stolen along with all the French crown jewels. Almost everything else in the French crown jewels were recovered in and around Paris. One piece that was never ever seen again was the piece of jewelry that had the blue diamond in it. it disappeared. Wow. In, t in about 20 years later, in 1812, a blue diamond appears for sale in London. It's 45.5 carats, the same diamond that we know today as the Hope Diamond. And suddenly out of nowhere, here's this blue diamond being described as being now for sale suddenly, the finest blue diamond ever. And eventually it gets acquired by a private collector in about 1821 or 22, Henry Philip Hope. And that's the name where the name comes from, the Hope Diamond. It now becomes part of his collection. Well, interestingly, in all the reading you do about 
blue diamonds, the major diamonds in the world at that time, they still talk about this blue diamond that's part of the French crown jewels and this blue diamond that is now in Hope's collection in England. And it wasn't until the late 1850s that somebody finally said, you know what, that one that was in France, we now know it was stolen, it's probably this diamond that Hope had is probably the recut version of that. They finally make that connection. Who was the person selling it in London? It's, he's a, a gem dealer by the name of Eliason. He's a well-known diamond dealer, and how he exactly acquired it, we don't know whether it was directly from the person who stole it or whether mm-hmm. it changed hands a few times. It was recut, obviously. It went from the 69-carat heart-shaped stone to the 45-and-a-half-carat cushion shape in 1812. So whether it was cut simply to disguise it so that nobody had to answer questions about whether this was the French blue Mm -hmm. or whatever reason, it was recut. And so until the 1850s, no one finally, at least in writing, said, you know what, these are probably the same stone. And so after Hope died, it stayed in his family until about 1900. It was sold by one of his heirs and then eventually was sold by Pierre Cartier, French German, French merchant in Paris, and it was sold to one of his good customers, a woman named Evelyn Walsh McLean. Evelyn Walsh McLean lived here in Washington, D.C., and that's what brought it here to this country. And she was the daughter of a gold miner, actually gold silver miner in Colorado, struck it rich, and moved his family here to uh, Washington, D.C., and so she grew up here and married the son of the owner of the Washington Post newspaper. So there was two fortunes that kind of got pulled together here. Mm -hmm. And so they would travel to Europe, and she would stop to see Pierre Cartier and always buy some spectacular piece of jewelry from him. So on one of her visits, he showed her the Hope Diamond. She didn't buy it at that time, but Pierre Cartier, not one to give up easily, he brought the diamond here to Washington, D.C. in a new setting, left it with her on a Friday afternoon and just said, here, you know, wear it around the house for the weekend. I'll come back Monday and we'll talk. Wow. And so she was absolutely mesmerized by the diamond, convinced that she had to own the diamond. The Hope Diamond, okay, is this wild? Is the Hope Diamond's rumored to be cursed, right? Yeah, it was. Uh, so people thought that, you know, misfortune or tragedy would befall anyone who owned it or who wore it. But what Jeff actually told me is that these rumors were false and they were probably just fabricated to drum up interest in the diamond and to increase its value. Well, it's only in the 20th century that people even start talking about the possibility of this diamond having bad luck associated with it. It's a totally new part of the story of the Hope Diamond. But Evelyn Walsh McLean was one that really liked to talk about that. And Pierre Cartier, we think, certainly enhanced that story to get her interested in it. But When we look back, well, where did this curse story originate? The earliest mention we can find anywhere is in 1908, there's a news story that comes out in the New York Post, and it's about this blue diamond that's owned by Franklin and Sons, a jeweler in New York, that's in their vault, and it goes on and on about, you know, all the dark secrets of this diamond and things it could do to somebody if it got out of this vault and all this kind of stuff. And it's pretty clear when you look at the context This was a time when there was a recession going on in the United States. Diamond prices were down. And, you know, any publicity is good publicity, right? So here's Franklin Sons. They got this diamond sitting in the vault. They can't sell it. What do you do? You get a newspaper article written about it. And so there's it's completely fabricated. But here we go. And that seems to be the origin of the whole curse thing. And, of course, once it's in the newspaper, then it just gets picked up. And every time the story is told, it gets a little bit bigger and better. And various people start cashing in on that story and write books about it. And there's a little movie done on it and everything else. And so that all becomes part of now the common lore. So Evelyn Walsh McLean kind of adds to it by the fact that despite all of her wealth, she had a lot of pretty sad things happen in her life. You know, she lost a son in an automobile accident. Her daughter committed suicide. Her husband ended up in an insane asylum. And so for people who like to believe in curses, they're going, well, look at all these terrible things that happened to this rich lady. It must be the curse. Well, she died at a relatively early age as well, and her collection then was sold to Harry Winston in New York. In New York, a million dollars worth of jewels is seen being delivered to gem dealer Harry Winston, the collection of the late Evelyn Walsh McLean. 
The chief treasure is the famous blue-white Hope Diamond. I say famous, but perhaps a better word would be notorious, for the stone has a history of ill luck going back over 300 years. Legend has it that a curse rests on whoever owns the Hope Diamond. It's a marvellous jewel, even if tragedy has usually attended its flashing beauty. And Harry Winston, you know, he liked to tell a story or two about a gemstone as well. To keep. <laughs> so he traveled the Hope Diamond around the United States for about 10 years as part of what he called his Court of Jewels exhibit. And so a lot of people in the United States got to see this diamond as it traveled around. In fact, you know, we'd go into small towns and they'd have a special showing, you know, if there was a local charity event or whatever, you know, the wife of the mayor would wear the Hope Diamond and get a picture in the paper. And, wow. you know, it was all good promotion for the charity, but also for the Hope Diamond. And finally, in 1958, then, he decided to give the diamond here to the Smithsonian with the idea that we could start this great national gem collection. And so by that point, a lot of people heard of it. You know, people still knew about Evan Walsh McLean. It's hard to find a picture of her without her wearing the Hope Diamond. Wow. So her eccentricity with the Hope Diamond kind of added to the story. So it was something that people had heard of. And for whatever reason, when it came here to the Smithsonian, it just really resonated with people. You know, you, you always wonder, why is it this thing just becomes so fascinating to so many people? But when it came here, it's really put this museum on the map as a destination for people in Washington, D.C. And for whatever reason, it became the must-see item here. And it became sort of the, the core, the beginning of our great national gem collection. The collection grew, you know, more people got interested in this idea of building building a great national gem collection. It's like, yeah, I'd like to be part of that too. Let me give something. Let me, And suddenly we've got one of the great collections in the world. All right. So you, you said you said researcher, right. um, but it sounds more like caretaker. I don't mean that disparagingly. That but is so part does, of his job. Okay. Right. So, but how, like, what's the research component? Like, how does one research a rock? Very carefully, actually, oh, right. especially when it's a priceless heirloom. So the good thing about the Hope Diamond being here is that we can study it. And the good thing about being the curator of the collection is I can study it. <laughs> and so yeah. we had, you know, the instruments were set up here in the department. We brought the Hope Diamond off exhibit, took it out of its setting. We spent a, a night analyzing the Hope Diamond. We used an in instrument called the Time of Flight Secondary Ion Mass Spectrometer, which we had here in the department. With that instrument, we could directly measure the amount of boron in the diamond. It's the first time that measurement had ever been done. When and did you do this? We did that oh, about three, four years ago, or five years ago, you know. And so, you know, we literally had to sputter off a few millions of atoms off the bottom of the Hope Diamond, so it's a little lighter, but it's just, you know, a few millions of atoms. And from that, we could measure the amount of boron. And so we found, on average, about a half a part per million of boron in the Hope Diamond is what gives it the blue color. And the other interesting property the Hope Diamond has is when you expose it to a shortwave ultraviolet light in a dark room, and then you turn off the light, the diamond glows this bright orange color. And it will glow bright orange for about a minute. And you can imagine for people you know, who believe in curses on diamonds, thinking, oh my gosh, it's glowing this blood orange color. You know, It's just like too good to be true. <laughs> so you're going, well, what? You know, we know it's not the curse. So what it turns out it's the boron that also causes this phosphorescence. And so we've been doing measurements of the phosphorescence. It turns out that every blue diamond that we've measured has similar spectra that we can, you know, because now we have very sensitive spectrometers, we can measure this phosphorescence, and the details in these spectra, again, give us information about the boron in the diamond, how it's there, the behavior, the electronic transitions going on. So it turns out that for a simple material, there's just all kinds of interesting things, and the earth does it differently than the ones that might be made in the laboratory. All right, so that's that's one specimen, let's say. Uh, I mean, I've been to the museum, but I'm sure not everything's out. Like how many, what are we talking about here? How many are there, like a couple hundred? Oh, so many more. So <laughs> on exhibit, there's 3,000, but the entire collection is 375,000. Yes, I mean, most of them are sitting in drawers and cabinets. Sure. They're not like gem display quality, but in part two of this episode, which we'll get to, we actually go into the vault where all the cool stuff that's not on display lives. Okay, so before but, we get there, though. Yeah. Remember uh, Gem, the um, cartoon? I do. Gem in the... Gem, she's truly outrageous. What, what was her what? band? Or was that her on Nickelodeon? Gem in the... I don't remember. I didn't have cable growing up. Uh, uh, gem in the holograms. Yeah. Gem oh, holograms. my goodness. Yep. Okay, anyway. moving on. <laughs> Um, no, Every time I, we say jam, I think of that. I know. No, no, no. I want to know. So, like, so there's only there's a fraction 
out of what's right. behind. So, like, what's the story there? How do they determine what comes out, what doesn't? Like, how do they even get like them in their collection? Like, there has to be. There's a history there, right? Right. They want to include stuff about the actual specimen's history when they put them on exhibit. You know, the first thing you do is, is you really think about what are the stories, the messages you want to get across. I mean, you understand, you know, clearly I work on minerals, and so I'm picturing minerals and picturing crystals. And you're kind of going, okay, what is it we want people to learn from our exhibit when they leave here? How do we want them to be changed, to be different? What kind of impact do we think these stories can have on people? What do we think is important that people learn about these materials? And so once you've created that concept, then you go through the collection, you're kind of going, okay, what's the best way to tell this story? And in some cases, it's obvious. But ultimately, the thing we knew for sure is we wanted the specimens to be the storytellers. You know, we didn't want people to come into this gallery and just be reading a lot of labels on the, on the, on the wall or be looking at a bunch of computer screens or whatever. You know, we got the real things. You know, nowadays, you can spend your whole life looking at the world on a computer screen or a phone screen or whatever it is. I think, you know, it's funny, I think people in some ways are almost more excited to see our exhibits than maybe there was the time in the past because it's like suddenly everything's three-dimensional again. It's like mm -hmm. the, the real things. And you're so used to seeing images. I mean, you're seeing everything in pictures and everything that you kind of, there's, there's a whole different sensation now. You're going, wow, that is the real Hope Diamond. It's the real big chunk of quartz crystals. It's a real, and, and, and that has an impact in a way I think that really helps to sell the story, you know, because you know a picture just doesn't have that same impact. It's so it's you know it's two dimensional. It's 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 ephemeral. It's you know it's electronic. It doesn't have a soul. It doesn't have a personality. It's not there. Whereas when you stand in front of that mineral specimen, it has a personality. So the exhibit hopefully is just a beginning. It's a place where people can start to be awakened to this whole excitement of minerals in the earth and geology and the story of this planet we live on. And hopefully now they're going to want to find other places to follow up with that. What is it like for you to hold some of these specimens, to work on them? You know, like something yeah. like the Hope Diamond or something yeah. other, you know. Oh, it's, it's, it's a thrill and a privilege. It really is. I mean, I've had various reasons, for example, to hold the Hope Diamond dozens and dozens of times in the last, you know, 35 years, whatever. But every single time I put it in my hand, there is this, first, this sense of, isn't it incredible that this one diamond here has gotten so much interest, that has got so much history, that there's movies and books and over and over again, that you know, it's the first question people ask you about. It's just that this thing does that. You know, isn't that pretty amazing? And then you go, think with this thing, you know, it's worth, I mean, there's more value in that volume right there than almost anything else in the world. I talk to mineral gem dealers sometimes, and they're, they're selling gems. And so to them, you know, the gem is worth a certain amount of money, and if something happens to it, it's insured, and they get that money back, right? So right. no loss. And so they're all, they're sometimes giving me a hard time going, why are you being so persnickety about this? I mean, hey, it's just, you know, just the gem, you know? It's insured, and I'm going, yeah, okay, wait. It's just a gem, but this gem is one that everybody in the world knows is part of our collection. I can't replace this gem. I don't care how much money you give me, I can't replace it. This is, you know, an iconic gemstone. It may be the best in the world, maybe it's not the best, but it's the one everybody knows. It's the one everybody wants to see. It belongs not to me, it belongs to everybody in the world. It's a little bit scary. I mean, I'll be honest with you, there's a certain part of me that go, you know, someday when I walk out of here, I mean, it's going to be a you know, really sad, horrible day when I finally have to say I'm leaving the Smithsonian. But when I do that, the one sense of relief in a way is that, you know what, it's now somebody else's responsibility. Because, you know, there is a responsibility to looking after something that is more than just research specimens, more than just commodities. It's something that belongs to all of us that we all share in. Um, you know what's so interesting about this? It was, we were talking about in the beginning about how similarities to the, the um, to Ryan who curates the Apollo Moon Rocks, he said the exact same thing. Um, that, you know, it's it's not just, yes, it's a big responsibility, mm -hmm. but it's like this responsibility that we're, it's for all of us. That's why right. it's also such a big, ah, 
yeah, so beautiful. beautiful. But it's it like they're, they're they they feel this weight because it's not just it's not just doing it for NASA or in this case doing it for the Smithsonian. It's doing it for like humanity for the world. Man. Do you think we're doing this podcast for humanity? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that's that's the sense of of we are making the world the a better place. I feel so when important. I come down here to one podcast it. episode at a time. Somebody's gonna do it. Oh man! All right, all that's all from Third Pod from the Sun. Thanks so much to Lauren for bringing us this story, and thanks to Jeff for sharing his work with us. Uh, this podcast was produced by Lauren and mixed by Kayla Surrey. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Please rate and review us. Uh, listen to us wherever get you, you get your podcasts or at thirdpodfromthesun.com. All right. Thanks all. And we'll see you next time. Jim, she's truly outrageous. <laughs> truly, truly, truly outrageous. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh we're going to have a lawsuit on our hands. <laughs>